Hello everyone, today we will start with the uh, most basic epidemiological study design called case reports or case study. <clears throat> so case reports or study um, falls under the category of observational and descriptive research, des uh, research design to present patients in their natural clinical settings. So case study is basically what all clinicians do in their clinic every day when they see patients. So um, case reports and study um, are the same kind of research where case reports typically consist of a couple of cases and case study involves multiple patients. So um, as a formal research design, um, case study is a detailed description of the symptoms signs, diagnosis, treatment, and or follow-up of an individual or small group of patients. Um, by nature, almost all case studies are anecdotal and experiential. So um, it is descriptive or exploratory in nature, and therefore uh, this is considered as the least conclusive type of scientific information. Um, However, if you want to publish a case report in a journal, um, you still have to go through a formal peer review uh, process where two or more anonymous reviewers are signed uh, by a publisher to read your case report and decide if your case is worth publication. So for more, uh, for more experienced healthcare professionals, um, case study can provide clue of previously unrecognized symptoms or syndromes Whereas um, you know, the same case study can serve as a teaching tool and a model for inexperienced clinicians or students. So topics that are typically included in, in case study are such as um, unique or rare features of a disease or unexpected findings in the course of observing or treating a patient and so on. Here are some interesting sample case studies uh, found from the New England Journal of Medicine. So um, in the picture, we have a young Iranian man um, who knew that, you know, from birth, he had a benign tumor on his eye, uh, which is just below his pupil. But by the time he was 19, the tumor had grown to about a quarter inch thick and started sprouting hair. His visual acuity was 6.6 in the normal eye and 6.18 in the right eye with tumor. Um, the intraocular pressure was normal, although this type of tumor isn't typically harmful and cancerous. It can grow cartilage, hair, and sometimes even sweat glands. So not everyone with these tumors um, you know, wants to um, um, remove, uh, remove the, the, the tumor, but you know, doctors did remove the hairy tumor from the man's eye. And as expected, there was a little improvement in visual acuity after surgery because of the amblyopia and induced astigmatism. So this case report is um, actually a 10 year follow up of a 42 year old male electrician um, who came to the eye clinic with decreasing vision after a month. He had an um, electrical burn of 14,000 volt to his uh, left shoulder. So at the time, his vision in both eyes were limited to perception of hand, mo uh, hand motions. And slit lamp examination confirmed bilateral cataract, unfortunately. Now, four months after the injury, the patient underwent cataract extraction and implantation, uh, implantation of an intraocular lens, which was followed by um, the um, improvement in visual acuity to 620 in the right eye and 6120 uh, in the left eye. Two years after the injury, uh, there was a retinal detachment in the left eye and the patient underwent repair. At a 10-year follow-up visit, um, the patient's visual acuity was 630 in the right eye, but in the left eye, he could only count fingers. 
While it's not entirely clear why the cataracts um, take on a stellar shape, but the uh, ultimate takeaway is quite clear. Be safe around electricity. So a 42-year-old woman from Dundee was referred to ophthalmology by her GP um, with, uh, with complaints of um, you know, left upper eyelid swelling and ptosis over six months, as shown in the picture. And the ptosis was a bit mild, but um, you can see that you know, her left eye is um, there, it's a bit, a little bit droopy. And then see the swelling up here. And then <clears throat> in the clinic, the heart vision was okay. Um, in fact, it was good, six over four. And there was no sign of discharge from the eye whatsoever. So they um, ran the MRI scan of the orbit, and it actually shows the nodular lesion. Uh, which was associated with the surrounding soft tissue swelling. So they decided to do a surgery and they found a cyst, uh, you know, a sac filled with fluid within the soft tissue superior to the superior fornix. And, you know, in the middle of the, uh, the surgery, the cyst ruptured and this is what they found. a hard contact lens and was later confirmed uh, that this was actually um, the rigid gas permeable lens, RGP lens. And you know, upon the follow-up, um, the patient's mother recalled that you know, her daughter had been struck in the eye by a shuttlecock when she was 14 playing badminton. And <clears throat> According to her mother, um, she was wearing RGP lens at the time, obviously, and then, which was never found. So um, they assumed that the lens had been, you know, knocked out by the impact. Um, so what then actually happened uh, uh, was that um, the lens, in fact, migrated into the eyelid following the trauma and was dormant for 28 years, just sitting there for 28 years. And then, you know, which is known to be the longest time between the traumatic RGP lens migration into the eyelid and the presentation of eyelid swelling. So finally, this is a French case report of COVID patient showing the ocular symptoms. So the pictures are taken by uh, the patient using, uh, his, um, using the smartphone, showing the sign of conjunctivitis in the left eye as the uh, first presentation of COVID-19 during teleophthalmology consultation. And the exact mechanism by which the virus ends up in tears is not fully understood, but it has been proposed that the ocular surface can act as a gateway for infected droplets and aerosols to enter the body. So there have been uh, multiple reports of the viral presence on the ocular surface and their potential cause of ocular complications. And by the way, this is one of my dissertation topics for the final year this year. And it looks like uh, it'll continue to be so. So when you become fourth year, um, let me know if you are interested in this topic. So um, as a summary, here are some good things and bad things about the uh, study design. So in addition to the rich information and very detailed description of case provided by case study or case reports. Um, this study design can be very useful for its invaluable educational value. So the practice of identifying and developing a case study promotes critical thinking and learning skills of student clinicians. Um, in turn, uh, can be directly applicable to the practice and the clinic. And obviously, running a case study is easy to do. 
um, it's fast and there's no heavy financial burden. And better yet, it only takes a single case to initiate a case study. Um, case report or study can be very helpful to forewarn what's coming in the town in case of epidemic. If you see an unusual presentation of a disease, then you know that something is going on. And it only takes a single patient to spread infectious disease, so it is important to be vigilant and attentive to the detailed aspect of disease. Another potential virtue of case study design is the possibility of quick publication as a way of rapid communication among, among clinicians. But at the same time, it is highly subject to publication bias, uh, where only novel, rare, and atypical results are much more likely to be published among all the available results to be published. For example, um, you know, those case reports with like a hairy, hairy eyeball or you know, star-shaped cataract will be much more likely published than a case report of a myopy patient. So in general, um, typical unremarkable cases are less likely reported, and other typical limitations include the lack of generalizability.